And welcome to today's webinar on giving a webinar. Um, we've been running these webinars now for over a year, so we thought it was time perhaps that we, we shared our experiences with you. Um, and Pfizer, who's our business development manager here, will be taking you through our, our presentation and sharing some of her best practice tips and advice on how to give a great webinar. Um, and I think many of you maybe know Pfizer already, but just to introduce her briefly. She's our business development manager here at the London School Group. Um, previously, she's worked in a number of ed tech companies over in Canada. Um, and Pfizer, you may know, has quite an interesting cross-cultural background, being um, of Bangladeshi origin, born and raised in Saudi Arabia, um, but now a, a Canadian citizen, but working with us here in, here in London in the UK. Um, and I hopefully most of you know me as well. Apologies, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Kathy Wellings, and I'm the director here at LSIC. Um, great to see so many of you with us again this month. I know it's a, a busy time with holidays and everything. Um, as you know, we're well. Most of you know we're together for just under an hour. Um, there will be some time at the end to ask questions. But if you'd like to jump in and ask questions along the way, then please do. Those of you who've been with us on these webinars before will know that we try to make them as participative as possible. So please do join in. It's much more interesting, hopefully, for you if you get involved. Um, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Pfizer. Um, you are all unfortunately muted and not on video, so you can see and hear us, but um, unfortunately we're not able to see or hear your voices, but hopefully we'll see your comments um, through the various tools that we use during the webinars. So you have the opportunity to write on the slides with the annotation tool. So just to do a little quick practice, hopefully you can see a, a toolbar down the left-hand side of your screen. Um, there's a T for text, for example, and there's a, a little pen icon for those of you who feel more creative and would like to draw something. So if you want to try, you just need to click, for example, on the T and then click your mouse onto the screen and you can type something just to make sure that's working. Okay. Lovely. We, I can see we have some creative types with us today, using the colors and everything. You've, most of you have found the chat already, so there will be some points where Pfizer will ask you um, to share your opinions or your thoughts in the chat box. So again, please feel free to do that. Um, we do always record the webinar, so as those of you who attend regularly know, you'll get a, a link to the recording um, sometime tomorrow if you um, would like to share that with colleagues or people that haven't been able to join, please feel free. Um, I think that's everything from me. So I will now hand over to Pfizer, leave you in her capable hands for the next 45 minutes or so. Thanks, Pfizer. Thank over you very much, you. Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. And if I could just get a quick show of hands to make sure that everybody can hear me OK, um, if you could just raise your hand, you should see that function as well. Um, so give me a good, excellent. Um, if at any point in time I'm not coming in loud and clear, just feel free to raise your hands again um, and let me know. Thank you very much for that. You can all unraise now. Um, so as, as Kathy said, my name is Faiza and I'm the Business Development Manager here at the London School Group. Um, to give you, what we wanted to do today was um, go through some tips and tricks for helping you deliver a great webinar presentation. I think when you're working internationally, you often end up communicating with people via webinar. So we thought it might be helpful to share some of the, the tips and tricks that we use. Um, in terms, as Kathy mentioned, we have about an hour today. Um, so it'll probably be about 30 to 40 minutes of me presenting and then questions and interactions throughout. And it's loosely structured in, in three main parts. So first of all, we'll take a look at what makes a great webinar structure. Then we'll, we'll discuss some ways of engaging and interacting with your audience. And then uh, the final section looks a little bit at technology and then also what to do if something goes wrong. Uh, with that in mind, I've had a few connection issues uh, today. So if at all, at any point I go out, just give me a couple of seconds and I should be able to come back in. But I thought I'd give you guys some warning in advance first. Um, so without further ado, let's get stuck in. 
And um, start off with, we wanted to ask you a poll question. I wanted to know why everybody was attending today's webinar, um, whether it's because you're often doing presentations and you'd like to improve your skills, you're about to start doing webinars and you'd like to prepare, you have no experience and you just want to learn, or if it's something else, let me know in the chat box. Um, and as that poll is going on, I just wanted to also give you a bit of background about me. So as Kathy mentioned, I worked in Canada in higher education. And as part of my role, I often did monthly webinars to international students. So I've done this for a few years, as well as doing them now with LSIC. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd sort of share some of those words of wisdom that we pass along to our co-presenters here as well. Um, it doesn't mean I don't get nervous. So there might be moments throughout the webinar that I might. Um, but if it's taught me anything, it's that anything can go wrong, and it generally does, um, but also that audiences are largely very forgiving. So we'll see how the journey goes today. Um, hopefully it'll be a smooth ride, fingers crossed. Um, but yes, the poll is now closed, and let's take a look at the results. So by the looks of it, we've got about a third of you who do present webinars and you'd like to improve your skills, another third who are just about to start, so you want to prepare, and then some of you have no experience at all, so you'd like to learn more. So hopefully, I think, with the way we have things structured, you'll pick up some tips if you've been doing this for a while. But even if you have no experience at all, you should come back with some takeaways. So the first section we're going to take a look at is what makes a great webinar structure. I, I always like to start with some definitions so that we all know what we're talking about. So a few things from some quick Googling. Um, a webinar is a seminar or presentation that takes place on the internet. You can participate from different locations and ask questions and answer polls. Uh, one thing I hadn't realized was that webinar was short for web-based seminar. So that was my one new thing I learned a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the, the way that we'll be talking about webinars today is more of um, the style where the speaking voice comes from the presenter. Um, so it's more you're presenting on a topic rather than having a group discussion. So um, we'll, we'll be taking a look at that webinar style. And then also, just in terms of the content of today, it's focusing more on how to optimize using webinar tools and some tips and tricks, really, rather than how to be an effective presenter. The way I tend to look at most webinars when I approach them is, is splitting them up into three main components. So there's the presenter-led content. Um, that can be the text, the images, the graph, but the, the main meat of the presentation. There's the audience participation part. So you guys answering the poll question for me, those are kind of structured sections within a webinar. There's feedback where you get it ad hoc as you see through the chat. It's great to see some familiar faces on there. Um, and that can kind of come at any time during a webinar. And then there's the bit, the discussion, where it's the Q&A section, maybe it's some commentary that somebody's making on what's being covered in the webinar. And in my experience, the best webinars tend to have a good balance of it, um, where you sort of intersperse things so that you have good engagement throughout. And I like to look at things more as symbiotic and circular. So they all kind of feed into each other rather than a linear relationship of here's the presentation part, here's the questions, here's the discussion. It just, I think, makes the webinar seem a little bit more alive and organic. Um, and it also helps you as a presenter so you can check in and, and monitor how things are going, but also just to, to change the voice so it's not just one person always speaking. With the structure of any webinar, I think the key is to find a balance. Um, so that generally depends on the nature of the webinar. If it's presenter heavy, like this one might be, um, where you're discussing a certain topic, or maybe you're doing some training, then there will be a lot of the presenter voice. Um, but you could also have webinars where it's more audience heavy. Um, so whether you're asking for feedback or discussion, so there your role turns into being more of a facilitator than anything. And hello to everybody who's joined us. We're just getting a tuck in to the, the main meat of the, the webinar. So thank you guys for coming in. Um, another thing to consider when you're looking at the balance is who's the audience? Do you know them? Um, do you not know them? If you do know them, what do you want from them? So do you want to ensure that they're all engaging? Or um, would are you comfortable with them just kind of getting the information? As a presenter, are you? 
aiming to lead a discussion? Are you facilitating a discussion? Uh, so what sort of role do you want to play? It, it all helps you sort of structure the webinar in the way that you think would be most effective. And then the way that I like to think about webinars as well is what part is structured and what part is interruptions. Um, and a lot of that sort of depends on maybe the time you have together and also the audience that you have. So do you want to encourage feedback from them? Um, do you want there to be some learning and conversations between the participants themselves? Uh, and sort of one good way to think about it is, is can somebody contribute to the conversation? Do they have enough information? Do they have experience? Um, do they have expertise? Or, or is this something that they can just give their feedback to at any time? And a lot of it boils down to what you're comfortable with. Are you OK if, it's, if there are interruptions because somebody's asked a really good question? Or for example, you've had to deal with a tech challenge. Can you move with that? Or would you rather it's all structured? And many times, that can depend on how much time you have. So if you only have, as we do today, for example, an hour together, is there a specific aim? Was there a, a certain amount of content that you wanted to get through? And if so, can you adjust with interruptions, or would you rather just make sure that you're moving along at the pace that, that you're comfortable with? And um, a lot of times, finding the right balance is about finding the perfect recipe. So as usual, I think most of us know, you want to have a good mix of text, images, engagement, discussion. Um, you can often break up the pace of a webinar with poll questions. It's a good way for you to get a pulse also on the audience just to make sure that they're, they're still with you, that they're still engaged. Um, one of the things that I found very helpful when I, when I do webinars is to have Q&As throughout the process as well, um, and not just at the end. And then that, in case it triggers something that you could then discuss. Um, it also helps if you can change the voice. So um, maybe if there's a co-presenter there or you ask audiences uh, for their feedback, and I would like to ask you guys, um, if you could think of a webinar that you've enjoyed, can you tell me why? What, what about it was engaging? What about it was effective? Um, if you can share just some of the things, and maybe we can all share with each other some other tips and tricks, too. Um, and as you guys are, are typing that away, um, the, the picture you see here actually has a special guest in it. I am in there. <laughs> um, so this is actually from something I do over the weekends, which is volunteer for, for a food kitchen. And much of how we start the day is we kind of take together ingredients from um, supermarkets and local grocers that are kind of ex expired and they've gone uh, on their sell-by date, but otherwise they're still perfectly good to cook with. But we sit down every um, week and kind of take a look at the ingredients and decide, OK, what's the, the best combination of things to do? So I just thought it was a good image um, in terms of what you also want to do when you're doing a webinar. How do you balance it with content, with questions, with discussion? Um, so a few things. So Corinne's shared that she attended one on mentoring, and they had breakout rooms during the webinar to discuss different topics, which was good. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, as I mentioned, I've kind of been doing webinars for the last seven years or so now, and the technology certainly changed. And one of the things I was most excited about was that breakout room concept, because it just allowed for people to have those smaller interactions in between the whole piece. Um, visuals, yeah, valuable pointers, that's always helpful. Um, Oh, Frederica, you make a great point here about having different expectations if they're free webinars or if they're paid. Um, I think often if you are asking uh, for a fee to attend a webinar, then you want to ensure that you have good, valuable takeaways um, so that people can, can have something when they've completed the webinar process as well. And often also you know, sharing a recording of it as well. So a webinar has a more um, shelf life to it. The exchange of best practices, definitely, those are good points. Um, the content itself being interesting, great. Well, thank you guys for, for that contribution. The other thing I've discovered in doing webinars is sometimes you just have to go with the flow, uh, which can be terrifying, I think, when you can't see your audience, you can't gauge if it's going well or if it's not. Um, I find that you know if, if you're new to webinars, you often catch yourself constantly asking everybody, is everything going OK? Is anybody out there style of situation? So I think with practice, you'll learn to be comfortable with not being able to see who you're speaking with um, and being comfortable with silence. 
this is something that I find still takes practice for me. Um, I sometimes talk a mile a minute, which I may do at certain points throughout the webinar. And if I do, just let me know and I can slow it down. Um, but it helps if you can just allow for some breathing spaces. Because it's a lot of content, um, it can get quite intense. I think the thing I always try to remember is, is time might seem like it's going by really slowly for you, but it's actually only been a few seconds. Um, so to, to just let yourself sort of sit in those silent moments is always helpful. And if you find that a little uncomfortable, then you can fill the, the dead air with stories and examples. Um, and one of the, the tips that we wanted to share with you guys as well is asking for questions in advance so you can give people time for typing. Um, I've been to a few webinars where it, you sort of open it up and you're like, are there any questions? And then as you're waiting, you fall into the, the trap of being like, someone is typing. Multiple people are typing. Um, which can be funny at, at the time, but then, um, you know, we work internationally as well that you might have uh, people who are contributing where English is not their native language and they're typing and they could feel pressure if someone's like, oh God, they've seen me typing. Um, I need to type faster or I don't want any typos or whatnot. So sometimes it just helps before you go into a Q&A section just to give people a casual reminder just beforehand to say, hey, the Q&A is coming up. If there's anything you guys would like to ask, feel free to do so in the, in the chat box. And with that, I'll also, if you guys have any questions that you've thought up, feel free to, feel free to um, contribute those as we move along. I think we're all guilty of losing track of time when you're in your little bubble of presenting and you're looking at your slides, you're looking at your notes, you're wanting to make sure that you get everything there. But I think it's always very important to ensure that you keep um, an eye on the time. So monitor your speed, um, make sure you can adjust your pace and the content. And this is again where when you're trying to find the right balance, it helps if you can take the pressure off yourself a little bit by having that audience participation. So when you ask them to contribute, if there's a poll going on, it just gives you that moment to, to take a pause. Um, one of the tricks that we do here is we like to manage expectations and, and sort of set the stage with our pre-session announcements. So it's small things, but doing a little audio announcement um, 10 minutes, five minutes beforehand, letting people know that we're getting ready to start or writing it in the welcome chat all just prepares people who have come a little bit in advance and adds a, a professional touch to things as well. Um, as I did at the start, kind of outlining how you're hoping the webinar will unfold of, OK, well, the, most, the majority of the time I'll be doing some speaking, but then we'll also have time for and opportunities for discussion. Um, so that can always help. I think one of the things we realized uh, once we first started doing the webinars was doing housekeeping rules and how helpful and effective that is. Because um, when I first started doing webinars, I think everybody was getting their head around, OK, what is this technology? How does this work? How do I contribute? It's a lot easier um, if everybody's in front of you and you can establish the ground rules. And so I think it's even more important when you're doing it on an online space to have those, those housekeeping rules established just means that people have less confusion if you're like, oh, answer the poll question now, or can you type this in for me? If you allow yourself them to kind of familiarize with the features that are available, um, it just means that when you do ask for engagement, there isn't that time waiting to, to test things out. Um, and, and one of the other tricks we have, because you know webinars can go in many ways, and it's all, always dependent on sort of who turns up and how you want things to unfold. And, what I've found is, you know, there, with all the best of intentions, you can have webinars and you can only have a couple of people turn up. Um, and so what do you do? And so one of the tricks that we suggest is sort of make small talk to allow for newcomers. Um, case in point was today's webinar at about like 1258 UK time. There were maybe five people on the webinar and then everybody started coming in. But in the back of my head, I was thinking, OK, well, you know, maybe I'll ask people to let me know where they're joining us from what countries there are, maybe you could talk about the weather, that's a very British thing to do, or a recent event, and there you kind of have to be a little bit careful uh, about making sure it's something neutral um, and that can connect with everybody who's um, at the webinar. 
Um, and I, as I didn't have the chance to ask it at the start, I'd still love to know where everybody's joining us from. Um, I always find it interesting. So if you could just type in, let me know where you're calling in from. Um, we'll, we'll see how many countries or cities we have. Um, so that kind of wraps up the, the content piece of it. So, you know, you've got your webinar, you've got your structure, you've decided how you want to balance it. Um, the next piece of the puzzle is, okay, now the webinar is here. How do you engage and how do you interact with your audience? Um, so there are many different ways. You could do polls, you could do questions, you could have a whiteboard, breakout rooms, as we mentioned, in different scenarios. Um, so with that kind of, so actually, in response to everybody typing in where they're from. We do have quite a few places. Um, so we've got somebody here from Sweden, from Belfast, from London, Wales, Moscow, Manchester, Nottingham, Windsor, Holland Park, Ecuador, Surrey, Poland. OK, so lots of people dialing in from different places. But this kind of, and again, gives you an example of, of some of the participation options that you have. Um, it's always good to play around with the technology beforehand so you can get comfortable. Um, one trick that I've found is is also pretending to be a, a an audience member, so then you know what you see. Uh, there are many different platforms out there that you can use for presenting on webinars, and some of them, the toolbar for the presenter might not be in the same place as it is for an audience member. So you can be presenting and being like, on the left-hand side, you will see, and the audience will be like, I don't see anything on the left-hand side. So if you sort of log in, as an audience member, um, then you then when you when you are asking somebody to do something, you can guide them appropriately. So that's just a, a tip as well. Um, and the other one is you know it it's moved beyond polls and questions nowadays. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, breakout rooms are great for discussion. But even stories or or how somebody would handle a scenario. Um, a, about nine months ago, I remember going to a webinar, and it was one of the first where somebody had said, OK, here's a question I've posed to you. How would you respond in this situation? And what was really great was seeing the, the feedback coming from different members of the audience of like, well, this is how I would approach it, and this is how I might. Or, oh, I didn't realize that that was a way that we could um, approach that problem. But it was just great for, for creating that discussion when you can often feel like it's just you speaking in one direction. And uh, with kind of giving an example of audience participation, we are going to do a bit of a whiteboard exercise. Um, so as we're kind of swapping the, the tech part of it to illustrate the, the whiteboard functionality, um, the question I, I have is, can you guys share with me what you think are some of the benefits of, of particular types of audience participation? So things like polls, Q&A sections, and whiteboards, and then also what are the potential risks as well of when you are asking for audience participation? So um, feel free to use the text tool. Feel free to use the marker if you're feeling a bit adventurous. Um, but if you could share to me what you think are the benefits of some of these tools and what are some of the risks. So one of the um, areas that I've always found interesting is the anonymity piece um, with some of the participation tools, um, you often have the opportunity for people to sort of anonymously type things in, like on a whiteboard. Whereas if it's a public um, chat function, then it's a little bit more public, so people are hesitant. I think we're going through a slight technical hitch. Um, so we're just resetting the whiteboard. But this is also where a slight trick. Um, if you have the slides as a backup as well, in case the technology fails on you, at least you have what you intended in the back. Um, so not to worry. We'll, we'll just proceed with the slide rather than the whiteboard. Um, so yeah, so, as I said, you know, the anonymity piece. Sometimes it comes in handy if it's a poll, because then people feel comfortable being like, actually, I have no experience in doing this, or I'm not sure about this. But then with the chat function, you, you have people taking ownership of the feedback they've given. But let's take a look at what some of you guys have contributed. So on the poll front, you think it's great for quick engagement. It's anonymous, collects opinions and views. Um, the risks, the results might be misleading, most definitely. You kind of have to take all the polls with a, with a pinch of salt. Um, you might not get the result you're looking for. Yes, that is very true. 
I have often gone to webinars where I've asked, what are you hoping to get out of this? And it's a curveball, but then you sort of take a deep breath and decide, you know what, we can, we can continue on and still have a meaningful discussion. Um, you might miss some of the options that can be, yeah, definitely, you can miss some of the options. And so that's why when I've, whenever I've actually done polls, I've always left the option at the bottom that says other and please write it into the chat function. Um, to give people the opportunity to be like, well, maybe this wasn't a possibility I'd considered. Q&A, yeah, most definitely the benefits are having an in increased interaction, personalized answers. Um, the risks, yeah, you get random off-topic questions. And we do have a slide coming up a little bit around how do you manage questions. Um, people might be afraid to ask questions or you have difficult questions that can't be answered or never-ending questions, <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, again, we'll cover a little bit of that in our managing questions section. Um, whiteboard, none of the benefits. <laughs> there are no benefits to whiteboards. No, that, that's a fair point, um, given the technical issues we had with it during this webinar. But um, yeah, it gives people the opportunity to be a bit more creative. Um, you know, maybe you want some feedback that doesn't have to be text. You might want it in a visual representation. Um, and you know, I think it, it lets people get a little bit more tactile. Um, in their feedback. And some of the risks, for sure, it's not a great feature. It's easy to rub off. Um, it, yeah, it might take people a little while to work out. You can have overlap in text, which is, I think, case in point here on the slide as well. But um, definitely lots of really great points here from you guys about the benefits and the risks. I think with everything, what I'd recommend is just feel comfortable and kind of almost give yourself permission that if it doesn't go according to plan, not the end of the world, you can move on. And with that, we'll move to the next bit piece on the audiences. And thank you again for, for contributing. Um, oh, great point from Sarah here that if you're on the mobile app, um, you can see the whiteboard pen, but it kind of limits how you can interact. So that's certainly one thing to consider as well with the, the audience participation features you use. Is it accessible for all? Is it easier if you're on a phone? Is it easier if you're on a computer or a laptop? So um, definitely a lot of good things to consider. Um, let's talk a little bit about international audiences. I think for the majority of us, we work on an international space um, and platform. So there are things you might want to consider that, that maybe you hadn't thought of um, when you're doing webinars to international audiences. So one of the things I always used to start my webinars with was saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to everybody. Because depending on where they were, um, the time zones would be different. So it, it's a small thing, but it works to, to help um, kind of acknowledge the fact that you've got an international audience there with you and that you're sensitive that, you know, I've often had students who were up at midnight or one o'clock in the morning because they wanted to connect with the university in Canada. And I would say thank you so much for being up that late. And I hope that this goes well for you. Um, your stories, are they too local? Are they international? Do they translate? Are you talking about something specific? Um, for example, one of the things I was thinking of was, was the solar eclipse that happened, but is that something that you know maybe everybody in the world was excited by, or was that more something that if you were in North America was, was something that everybody kind of stopped and, and took the moment to observe? So just, just making sure that you have that right balance of if it is local or if it is international, kind of what your audience would appreciate. Language, I think that's very important. Um, using global English, not getting too technical, or using things that might be um, colloquial. Uh, and also adding more text to the slides. So I think this is something that we certainly strive to do in our presentations because we're aware of having an international audience is we might have more text than you would normally expect. Um, and that's just because for some people it helps if they can see it written and then they hear somebody um, accents or something uh, that you also have to be mindful of, as I'm sure you've, you've probably heard a couple of Canadian outs and abouts as I've gone <laughs> through the webinar. But um, there are some accents that if you're not familiar with how they sound, it can help if there's the text there and you're like, okay, that makes sense. Pacing, again, I know I talk a mile a minute sometimes. So it's a question of taking those moments to slow it down a little bit um, to make sure that everybody is, is retaining the content and understanding. 
um, and using humor. Sometimes in certain cultures it works, in others it doesn't. Um, I tend to find self-deprecating translates universally, um, but you have to be careful a little bit with the jokes to make sure that you don't cause offense unintentionally, um, which is harder, I think, when you can't see your audience and you can't gauge if, if the room has taken it well or not. As I mentioned earlier, you, you sometimes find yourself in this little bubble in a tunnel of, is anybody out there? Is anybody listening to me? Am I talking to the void? Um, so how do you kind of almost console yourself in that situation, but how do you manage it as well? So one of the things is, is engagement. Um, so doing polls, asking for written feedback, writing on the slide. Um, and this is where, again, that point that I mentioned when we looked at the benefits and the risks of audience participation, I tend to find it's good to have a mix of anonymous feedback, but then also where people can take ownership. Um, and it just might mean that people who are a bit more quiet and don't necessarily want to, to type in and have things attributed to themselves still have the opportunity um, to engage and to participate. Um, some audiences might simply prefer just having somebody speak with to them. Um, Others might want to be able to contribute. I think you, you, depending on how much, of the, like whether you know the or engagement through polls is always helpful. Um, getting a sense of what your audience is comfortable with, um, whether they want to participate, whether they just rather you present, um, but also the monitoring feature on many of the webinar platforms. Um, gives you a sense of whether the audience is paying attention or not, so then you can adjust and you can pivot and maybe ask for engagement in a place that you weren't expecting. Um, but based on this, you now know um, that we know when you're paying attention <laughs> and when you're not. Um, so I hope that everybody is, and I think they had to due to our slight little turbulence. Um, but if I could just get a show of hands just to make sure that everybody can still hear me, that'll, um, that'll give me some comfort. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. That's very kind. Um, you can put the hands down, but thank you. <laughs> um, this section is all about managing questions. So we touched upon this. Um, and I think one of the things I found with questions is when you can't see your audience, sometimes you feel compelled to almost answer everything. Um, but give yourself that moment to just process questions as they come in. Um, and you know, I've always found it helpful just to repeat the question, um, maybe acknowledge if it's a good question or if it's a tricky question or one you hadn't considered, um, to give yourself that, that opportunity to process it and then provide a thoughtful answer. Um, again, when you're dealing with international audiences, you might almost have to reframe the question um, in case when somebody's typed it, it's not clear. Having said that, that doesn't have to be just exclusively if you're dealing with non-native speakers. I think sometimes if people type quickly and there's a few typos in there, you still have to decipher what the question is. Um, so saying it back and being like, is that what you were asking for? In many webinars, I've had really great engagement from the audience um, where I've said, I'm not sure if this is what you were asking, but if it is, this is my answer. And then they'll clarify and be like, yep, no, that answered it, or no, actually, I meant this. Um, what if there are too many questions? Uh, what I've often said is, you know, we'll answer as many as possible during the session, and then we'll follow up with others via email. Um, I had one webinar a few years ago where it was supposed to be a one-hour session and ended, ended up being two and a half hours. I had um, all these students that were asking very specific questions about scholarships, and I had about 150 participants at the start of it, and I was getting to the end of the presentation, and I was like, there are a lot of questions on here. Um, would you guys be comfortable if I just made it a Q&A session at the end? And some people were like, yeah, you know what? If you're happy to keep going, we're happy to keep going. So two and a half hours later, I still had 75 people with me asking questions. Um, so it just depends. Are you comfortable with it? Is the audience comfortable with it? Are you respecting your time? Do you have the ability to do that? Um, and the other, the other helpful thing is if you have a co-host, maybe they can field the questions to you to give you the opportunity to just focus on the answers, really, rather than sit there and try and have to keep an eye on the chat to see the question come in and, and do that. Um, and with all of it, just remember, you don't have to have all the answers. Um, so there might be questions that you come across that you're like, you know what, that's a great thing. I'm going to have to do some research on that, and I'll get back to you. Um, and then also, 
that's a great future opportunity to connect with whoever's attended the webinar um, as a way of following up with them and, and having a greater discussion. There's only so much that can be covered in a particular period of time. So um, it, it gives you that opportunity to continue to engage. Um, and with that in mind, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, if there's anything we've kind of covered a little bit around the, the structure and the audience engagement, um, particularly with managing questions, just feel free to drop that in. And if we're um, okay with questions, um, then we can move on to the next section. Um, one, I remember one of the more interesting questions I'd had in my time was a student asking about whether they were allowed to get married. And I wasn't quite sure where they were going with this. Um, so I decided to reframe the question and instead say, uh, if you're wondering whether your visa status changes as a result of you getting married, you might want to check with, with the appropriate people. Um, but I remember getting that question and just being like, I've never been asked about whether if somebody can marry um, while they're a student. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of just repositioning it and reframing it and seeing if it was helpful. Doesn't seem like there are any questions. so. We'll move up swiftly on to the next section, which is all about how to make the most of your technology. Um, it's sometimes terrifying to think, do I have to be on camera? Can I not be on camera? Um, we tend to say yes. Uh, I think it humanizes you. You can see all the facial expressions. I talk with my hands, which I'm sure you guys have observed <laughs> throughout the webinar. So I think it helps, because if something goes wrong, then you can see it happening. Um, it's good to keep your natural body language. I don't think I could sort of sit and just present if I tried. Um, I, I like to, to move around when I present. Um, and do what makes you comfortable. I think for some presenters, they like sitting down. Other people like to stand up. Um, and when it comes to if you are using the video and the camera, depending on your personal preference, you can either look straight at the camera or you can look at yourself on the video box, just whatever makes you comfortable. Um, I remember when I first started doing the video side of things, I kept looking at the camera, but then I kept getting distracted. So then I was like, you know what, I'll just flick my eyes up to the video box every now and again just to make sure I'm still there um, to do what you think is comfortable for you. We thought it might help also just to give you a quick checklist of, of things to go through as you're um, setting up for a webinar. So as we said, sort of familiarize yourself with the features. Um, if you can log on early, you can allow for tech issues. So that's what we did um, earlier today. And we realized that you know the connection was fine, but I was dropping in and out. Um, so that's why when we first started, I just mentioned if that does happen, you guys are prepared. Um, practicing muting and unmuting your microphone. Uh, you often end up with webinars where you can see a talking head, but you can't hear it. And that's because somebody's just forgotten to unmute their microphone. Um, practicing with the polls. What does it look like when you turn it on? What does it look like when you share the results? Remembering to um, hide that so that then you go back to the presentation screen. If you're planning to share different people's screens or if you're planning to switch screens, um, making sure that it works. If there's a video element, ensuring that that functions. Um, you'll see later in the presentation we had wanted to share a video, but we realized um, that, that would we'd be able to share the, the visuals but not the audio. So then we sort of had to, to look for a workaround. Um, but making sure you do that before the presentation so that when it comes to it, you're not having to problem solve on the fly. Um, and then whether or not you want to record it. Uh, I that will allow you to, to plan for the tech issues and it's just the irony of it that uh, there is a tech issue as I'm going through the tech checklist. Um, some tricks, uh, have some backups ready, whether it's a microphone, a speaker, a camera, a laptop, um, I've always, I've sometimes had content issues, so having a PDF version of the PowerPoint in case it's not working. Um, and one of the other tricks we suggest is just closing everything so that all you have on your computer is the webinar. Um, so then it means that there are no notifications that appear, that there aren't any phones that suddenly start ringing. Um, we in Canada used to have an office dog who sometimes made an appearance during our webinar presentations. Uh, he'd like to make his presence known, so kind of managing that. But you know, things that you can mute, like telephones, will eliminate any of the disruptions. There's also, um, I am back on camera, sorry, I hadn't realized. <laughs> uh, 
there's also that, you know, if you have your emails running in the background, if you get those pop-ups. I have been at um, webinars where, unfortunately, a pop-ups come up about the social program for everybody on Friday and you're sort of scrambling being like, oh God, how do I make it go away? Uh, easiest thing is just to, to close anything that's not urgent. And usually when you're doing a webinar, just having that platform up is, is more than enough. And as, as we've seen in today's webinar, if something can go wrong, it will. Um, so we've had a couple of technical glitches and thank you guys for bearing with us as, as we've gone through that. Um, it's one of those things where you try and problem solve um, as it's happening and I've kind of had everything set up and there isn't really anything I can further problem solve with it. So then all you have to do is sort of make everybody aware of it and bear with it and having a, a co-host, for example, um, in this situation with Kathy does help because then she can pop up and say she's coming back. Um, and if not, then um, it's good that we work very closely together so Kathy could take over for me if needed. Um, I always use humor in this situation because there's not much else you can do. Um, you just you just have to humanize yourself and let people know that you know we we had the best of intentions to have this go smoothly, um, but it doesn't always work out that way. And one of the tips we have is if you have a tech buddy um, available, if that's not an option, maybe uh, somebody from the audience could could help you out and flag things. So again, as we've had the the slight bumps. Um, in today's webinar, it's been very helpful. Thank you guys for when you flagged it and said, oh, can't hear you, can't do this, um, to then allow you to adjust. Uh, and as they say here in the UK, you just have to keep calm and carry on. Um, this next section is all about managing unexpected challenges. Um, so if you guys could share a little bit maybe with me of examples of when things have gone wrong. Um, we'll just we'll just share those stories in the chat function and I'll take a look at that if you like. Um, but perhaps I think now one of the most famous um, instances where a webinar went wrong is this news interview from the BBC. So if you I could just have a show of hands to let me know how many people are familiar with this interview. Um, and those of you who aren't, okay, I think it's most people. Um, for, but those of you who haven't seen it, we'll, we'll include the link in our follow-up. Um, but basically, this gentleman was doing an interview, and his his adorable children decided they wanted their 15 minutes of fame. And so they came into the room, uh, first his toddler daughter, and then his baby and the sort of baby walker things. And then his wife came in and tried to get the kids out, and he needed to keep a very straight face as he was doing all of this. Um, and so what do you do? in that situation, and that's the that's the question I have for you guys. What would you have done if it were you on national television and your children decide they want their five minutes of fame? Um, you can either type the, the answers um, on the slide here and, and let me know what you would have thought or include it in the chat function, whatever's easiest. Um, I honestly, when I, when I saw it all, I felt with sympathy. So I was like, I would, I've, I've had struggles in some webinars, but never on live television. Um, yeah, some good suggestions here. Lock the door beforehand, most definitely. <laughs> Andy, uh, put them up for adoption. Maybe that's a little severe. Um, but yeah, it's, it could be an option. Um, yeah, it's, it's so difficult because you also find yourself in this little focus tunnel um, when you're doing the webinars that all rational thought almost escapes you as you're dealing with unexpected challenges. So. There's so much of what you could have done. Um, yeah, definitely like that from you, Sandra, here. Smile, um, make your apologies, and then try to stay calm and carry on. Yeah, most definitely. Um, and it, I thought the reason I wanted to flag it is just to give you an example. Because I think you can feel like it's the end of the world if things go wrong. Um, but it isn't really. It could be so much worse. Sadly for, for for this gentleman, he's now a, a viral example of what could possibly go wrong. But it's just a sort of humbling reminder to you that it's not the end of the world. Um, so, but there are also some um, practical things. So ensure the room is secured, as somebody suggested. Post some signs, book a quiet room, lock the door if needed. Um, as, as some of you have also mentioned, kind of, you can choose to acknowledge the interruption. Um, yeah, Monica, there were some spoof videos as well where people uh, had done their version where they picked up the kid, put them on their lap, and then just continued on. 
um, other people, you know, if you know you have somebody who can help you um, and take the kids away, um, then maybe you could do that. And, you know, exactly as you guys are saying, just acknowledge it. We're all human. It, things happen. A two-year-old might not read a sign. <laughs> so how do you deal with that, that situation? Um, you can meet the microphone. You can close the notification. Um, invite the person to say hello. I've had that happen in webinars as well. And then people are just a little bit embarrassed. But usually everybody has a laugh about it. Um, and, you know, w there are opportunities if you can pause or, or um, the video or the audio feed, try that. Uh, not quite an option when you're on national television. Um, but it, it, it could work for some where you could sort of pass it off and be like, I'm sorry, I just have to deal with this, this issue. Um, one of the other areas I think we wanted to um, talk about as well is, you know, these are all tips and tricks if everything's going well, but what do you do if it's maybe not as you planned? So perhaps an audience hasn't come, you don't have as many participants as you would have liked, what do you do then? Um, so some of the things that I've done in the past is you sort of turn it almost from a webinar into a webcast. So you just share stories. And then if you are recording the webinar, then it works as a, as a follow-on piece where you can send to people being like, hey, here's an hour about webinar skills that doesn't really have any interaction in it. But if somebody needed just a, you know half an hour presentation, then let's do that. Um, if you have a small audience, then maybe do a poll question or a chat function and ask them um, what they want to achieve. And then you just sort of turn it into a discussion group almost, um, really, rather than a, a presentation that just sort of goes one way with some scheduled interaction. Um, having prepared questions, I, I remember we had to start doing that um, at the once we had done a few webinars. And it, it just helps, because maybe it'll help um, trigger people to ask questions because they hadn't thought of something. So if you have a co-host, if you have a partner, um, maybe ask them to have some planted questions that you can then get stuck into um, just to, to help uh, move the, the conversation along. Um, and then I think one thing that I um, tend to do as well is you can make it shorter. If you find that you've gone through the, converse, the, the content, you feel like you've, you've paced it well, you've covered things that are useful and that are relevant, and you're ahead of time, that's fine. Um, then just you know, sort of end the webinar earlier than you planned um, and sort of take it from there. So that covers the main meat of the webinar. And we'll be moving over to the Q&A um, shortly. So feel free to start sending your questions in. Um, then we will answer those in the Q&A section. And I just wanted to end basically with some summaries, just as a quick reminder of, of some of the tips and the tricks that we've shared. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to start typing them on. So some do's, I guess. Uh, strike a balance with presenter contents and audience-led con content. Um, ask for questions in advance, as I've just done. Um, be mindful of what you want to achieve in the time. So I've been kind of keeping an eye on the time here and being like, yep, you know, that's still a good pace for me. We'll still have about five, 10 minutes for Q&A that I'm comfortable with. And making sure that I kind of got through all the points that would be helpful for you guys as well. But I think it's, it's one of those small things that it, it shows that you respect the time everybody has available. Um, minimize the interruptions just by sort of closing any windows, um, turning off any notifications, putting up signs. Uh, and if at all possible, kind of have a co-host. It adds another voice. They can provide tech support. Uh, they can fill in for you when you disappear suddenly because of the wireless. <laughs> Um, and they can also ask you some questions. And some things don't limit the audience engagement just to polls into questions, get people to contribute, um, place them in breakout rooms. Those are all good things. Um, don't pressure yourself into answering every question. You don't have to have all the answers. Um, embrace the silence. Uh, if there are moments where you find there's slight lulls, don't worry about it. Just kind of keep going through. Um, don't be afraid to acknowledge any challenge or interruptions, as, as we said, kind of with the example as well. We're all human. We're all audiences are usually very, very forgiving. Um, and that's kind of my final point. You're only human. Um, you guys have been a really lovely audience. That I haven't done one of these ones in a little while, so thank you very much um, for, for being so open and, and giving with the questions and the interactions. I've really appreciated that. Um, but I think that's the most important thing to remember, that 
it doesn't have to be perfect. It's technology. Things will always go wrong. But just kind of, so long as you're connected and you're checking in, um, it should be all fine. And with, yeah, with that, we'll move on to questions. So Kathy's coming back to join Hello. us. Hello. Uh, thanks so much, Pfizer. I certainly learned a few new tips, even though I've been doing webinars for a long time as well. Um, and I can see there's some a few interesting questions come through. A great one from Martin around, is there a difference between the paid versus the free webinar? I don't know what your thoughts are on, on that one. I think people's expectations are a little bit higher if it's paid. Um, I think they would be more inclined to be like, I'd like to, for example, have a summary slide where I can have, these are the takeaways, these are the practical things I can do. Um, they might expect a certain caliber of presenter, so not somebody who's obviously nervous, um, someone who can kind of handle any questions. I think the, the bar is just a little bit higher because you've asked um, for some sort of payment. So I think it just means you need to have um, people with a lot of experience and be able to give practical takeaways. Mm. At least that's my thought. I guess I would also add, obviously, when you're doing um, free webinars, there's often a marketing angle or you know a soft sell. But I, my advice would always be keep that as soft as possible. So give the content. Um, and if you are going to have any kind of sales pitch, you'll see from ours that we don't really do that very much on ours because, from my perspective, it should still be as good a quality as a as a paid webinar because people are giving their time. But yeah, no, I, I agree with what you've said as well. Yes. Um, Andy does make a good point that maybe they're a little less forgiving of tech issues, but um, I think it's so hard with some tech issues that you can have the best plans as we did yeah. today and you still end up with a few blips. But yeah. it's hopefully more that people appreciated that we didn't end up panicking, being like, I don't know where Fize has gone. We don't know what to do with the webinar or me coming back being like, oh, dear, um, sorry, guys. You just sort of have to roll with it. And if this had been paid, then at least they'd know that whoever was presenting was comfortable and realized that, that there were challenges that were coming up. I agree. I mean, we, we do offer paid webinars as well, and we use exactly the same software. So this could have been a paid session today, and we'd have had the same problem. So it's tricky, but it's I agree, it's how you deal with it, really. Um, there's another one from Monica about um, advice on breakout rooms. I think keep the timing strict, that you want to ensure that you don't put them in a breakout room for too long, so then you lose the rhythm of the webinar. Um, you want to ensure that you give people enough time to be able to communicate with each other properly. Um, I think having a, a good question prepared as well for them to discuss so that there's almost like a finite number of points that they can go through rather than being an open-ended question um, can mean for meaningful discussion so that when you come back into the webinar, you can feed that through. Uh, I would, I, as I do with most things, just managing expectations as well. So saying to them, okay, we're going to put you into breakout rooms to tackle the question of, for example, what are the benefits of, of doing breakout rooms? And uh, we'll give everybody a minute and a half to do that. And then when you come back, if somebody from the group could then just give us the top three points, we'll discuss that as a whole. Um, it just means that you keep the structure, but you let people engage in a, in a smaller way rather than being like, you're in breakout rooms. Have fun. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And I think there's just one more from Andy around um, length of webinar. Is there an optimal length? Oh, in my experience, an hour is usually yeah. what most people are able to give in their day. Um, as I said, I've had them turn into two and a half hours. If you guys had more time, more questions, and we wanted to make this longer, we could. But um, an hour. <laughs> I always find a webinar should be as long as you think you need to deliver the content, to have a good discussion, and to have it be effective for everybody. So if you ever feel like you're talking and talking and talking and it's not really helpful, then you probably could have cut that slide. Um, you probably didn't need that extra discussion point. I, I mean, to give you guys an example, my original slide where I had any questions, there weren't any questions. I could have insisted and said, I need a question. Um, but I was like, nope, this is not the moment for it. Let's let's get to the end. So just adjusting and making sure every moment is is valuable or contributing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think like you said before, there's no shame in finishing a few minutes early if if you're done. Better to let people get on with their day. Um, another one from Brendan around choice of platform. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's a similar question as well here from Sarah. Um, whatever, he, honestly, I've used three platforms now. Each of them are different. Each of them have their benefits. The main thing is, is make sure you get comfortable. Even if you have to do sessions by yourself with nobody around you where you're clicking around sharing things or you get like a, a hosting buddy just to problem solve and triage, um, they're quite similar. For example, with a video example, I used to use GoToMeeting and I found that you could, I would just have been able to easily switch screens um, from the PowerPoint presentation to a web browser, but that's not the same in Adobe Connect, but we now know that for future. Um, but otherwise, it's just, you just have to try and break it <laughs> almost and make yourself completely comfortable so that when it comes to doing the webinar, you can deal with any unexpected challenges. Um, and yeah, I completely agree, Sarah. If you can send people information in advance, there are some platforms that require you to download a plugin and whatnot. So you might want to tell them, please log into the webinar five to 10 minutes in advance because you will need to download that software rather than people kind of coming in a minute before and then missing the first five minutes because they're just dealing with software. Great. Lovely. Um, WebEx is good. Yeah, I think it also depends if you're using um, webinars with specific clients, some organizations will have a, a platform in place already, so sometimes it's kind of checking in with your clients what they use. Um, I think that's probably it for questions. I think there don't seem to be any more, and if, we, if anyone has any other questions, then obviously um, let us know by email, and we're always happy to um, follow up with you afterwards. Um, so I think it's almost time to wrap up. I will do our, our little kind of mini soft sell that we do at the end of these complimentary webinars. So just really to let you know about the next webinar, um, next month on the 20th of September, we're doing a session around how really speaking a common language isn't always enough. So just because you speak English, it doesn't necessarily mean you won't have miscommunication problems. So why does it happen and what can you do about it? And then just... Um, a course we have coming up in a couple of weeks, working across cultures here in London on the 11th of September. You may have had our email already about the early bird promotion that we're running. Um, do feel free to take advantage of that. Let us know if you are interested. Um, otherwise, I can see we are bang on time. So I think we'll, we'll call it a day. And thank you all so much for attending. Apologies for the glitches. Of course, really, we did it on purpose so we could show you how we manage with those technical um, glitches. I'm sure you believe us. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Take care. See you soon. <laughs>